Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Tiny ML Talk series. My name is uh, Evgeny Gusev. I am from Qualcomm AI Research and also Tiny ML Foundation, and I will be your host today. It is 8 a.m. Uh, in California time, where I, I am based, and it's 5 p.m. in Paris, uh, where our speaker is. Again, it's a, it's a global event. And uh, today we are very pleased to see Dr. Amos Cerrone from Prophecy. Uh, he is going to be talking about machine learning for event cameras. So event-driven cameras is really a fascinating field of, um, of computer vision and, and, and machine vision. I, I've been following this field for many, many years and really a lot of progress in this field. And uh, Prophecy is one of these companies who, who lead uh, product development and technology development in this field. So we are really fortunate to have uh, Prophecy today and Amos as, as, as the presenter, and he's going to give us the, the latest and greatest on this field and what Prophecy is doing in commercializing these this, this cameras. So if you go to the next slide, Amos, please. Um, so first of all, it is my pleasure to acknowledge um, our um, sponsors and strategic partners so these talks and Tiny Mail Foundation would not have been possible without, uh, without their contribution, without their support. It's AUN devices, ARM, Deployed, Edge Impulse, MZ Visual Sense, Green Wave Technologies, Gravity, HOTG, ImagiMob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, which is uh, part of analog devices now, and um, Kixo. Qualcomm, Reality AI, Renaissance, it's a new new strategic partner, just joined us uh, yesterday. SAP, uh, Seed Studio, SenseML, uh, Sensense, and Sintient. And, and this list is growing like, like every week. So, so if you're interested, your company is interested in, in participating, please contact us, contact Olga at tinyemail.org or sponsorships at tinyemail.org and we will help, uh, we'll help you there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just an announcement. Uh, in a week, we're going to have another major event in, in the tiny ML world. So as many of you know, we have three major events a year. Uh, the summit in March, uh, that's kind of our flagship event, and European, Middle East, and Africa event in June. And in the fall, we have um, tiny ML Asia. So it's going to happen next week. Uh, it's going to be live as usual as uh, many tiny email events. You can go to the uh, to this QR code and register there. And this uh, event uh, registration is waived. Registration fee is waived, and this is thanks to to our sponsors and strategic partners. So just take a look at the program. Uh, the, the link is there, and you'll be amazed uh, how how diverse and how strong the program is. A lot of uh, great companies in in the Asia area and the global companies, the big names and startup companies, academic research. It's, it's really, I'm very happy about them, the, the program, the quality of the program that uh, the technical program committee uh, led by Wei Xiao from, from NVIDIA put together. A really, really impressive program and looking forward to this event live next week. It's going to be, uh, and the time zone is nine to 11 uh, China time. It covers most of the world. Um, uh, I think in, in Europe is going to be a little bit too late at night, but the rest of the world. And as usual, we'll have uh, presentations on, on, on the YouTube uh, to watch afterwards. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Yeah, another, another big announcement. Uh, I think as many of you know, we are super passionate about Dynamo for good. This is the area where we can uh, give technology back to people and, and use it to solve uh, the big uh, world problems like healthcare, STEM, airs, and um, climate conservation. So we are going to have um, our first Tiny Mail for Good workshop um, on November 17th. The, the website is also there. You see the QR code. It will take you to, to the website with, with more information. Again, it's going to be a a live event and thanks to the sponsors um, it will the registration will, will be will be uh, free and we are at this point we're also collecting abstracts for uh, lighting and talks so if you're interested in, in submitting an abstract for for this event uh, for lighting and talks uh, please go to the website again um, uh, www.tinyml.org and under the 
the anime of a good workshop, you'll, you'll, you'll see the instructions. But uh, it's going to be also very exciting to, to have the technology people talking to NGO people and, and really have a good call to action type of discussion um, in, in these three areas, e education, healthcare, and uh, conservation and climate, climate change. Next page, please, Hannes. As uh, you know, we had uh, our Tiny ML Vision Challenge with, uh, in collaboration with Saxter. It was uh, very successful. Uh, we had like 500, uh, 492, I believe, uh, people um, participating. Uh, there were 52 submissions, really high quality submissions. And we just announced our um, sponsors, the, the three teams uh, who, who won this event. And uh, you see more information on, on, the, on the Tiny ML uh, website. And again, we are very thankful to, to the sponsors listed below for supporting this uh, Tiny ML challenge. And we'll be doing more challenges uh, in the future. Um, I think we are thinking about one in the Tiny ML for Good Space, simply because uh, we want this community to work together, to partner together and, and, and solve this uh, big, big problems. Next page, please. And uh, announcement for this week. Uh, so as life is getting uh, more normal in, in many parts of the world, we are starting in-person events. So this is the in-person event that will take place uh, this Friday. It will be in, in the Venice area in Italy. It's organized by the Tiny ML uh, Italy group. And uh, there will be three presenters there. Uh, and uh, they will be talking about deploying tiny ML to industrial equipment. And uh, this, this event will be, will be in Italian and really focusing on the Italian um, uh, community. And uh, if you are interested in joining, you, you still will be able to join it. It will be live, but um, it will be in, again in Italian with slides in, um, in English. So it will be a good opportunity to connect to the Italian community and maybe practice some, some Italian as well, if you're interested in. And uh, as usual, if, if, um, uh, if you're interested in uh, participating in, in a talk series, you can uh, send um, your ideas and proposals to the talks at Tiny Mellow Talk. Pleasure to introduce our speaker. So it's Dr. Amos uh, Cerrone. He's been leading uh, the artificial intelligence team at Prophecy for the past four years. His work focuses on designing machine learning methods uh, for event-driven cameras uh, with applications in automotive, AR, VR, and IoT spaces. Before joining Prophecy, uh, Amos obtained his PhD in computer vision from the Ecole Polytechnique uh, Federal uh, in Lausanne, EPFL, a very famous place under the, the supervision of Professor Pascal Fua and Professor Vincent Lepetit. And his research interests lie at the boundaries between computer vision, AI, and neuromorphic systems. So the stage is yours, Amos, and really looking forward to this presentation. It's like a very, very fascinating field of event-driven cameras, spike and ne neural network computing and, and applications. So please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And hello uh, everyone. So yes, so today we'll talk about uh, machine learning for event cameras. So we start by a brief uh, introduction of uh, what are event-based sensors and their main differences compared to standard frame cameras. Then I will uh, um, I will uh, present some uh, applications and some uh, ways of applying standard machine learning techniques to event cameras and the kind of things that you can do today. And finally, some um, some discussion about the future directions and maybe some discussion about different type of models that are more uh, suited to process even even data, in particular spiking neural networks. So let's start with uh, even based uh, camera introduction. So as you probably know, the standard way of acquiring visual information in, in frame cameras is through um, a sequence of static snapshots. And the, the display of the static snapshots in a, in a sequence give us the impression of motion. However, this, uh, this uh, paradigm has some main uh, limitations. In particular, if we look at this, uh, at this example of a, of a golfer playing, you can see that uh, most of, uh, of the background pixels highlighted in, in red 
are uh, static during uh, the acquisitions. And so the camera is taking over the over for the same redundant information. While on the other hand, in the dynamic part of the scene, like the golf club or the ball, uh, the speed of this object is much higher compared to the frame rate that was selected for, for the camera. And so we missed all the information between the frames. So to, to overcome these, uh, these limitations, even by sensor uh, acquire visual information in a completely different paradigm. And uh, instead of taking frames, dense frames at a fixed frequency, uh, each pixel in an event sensor is, uh, uh, is independent and will only react to changes in the scene. So as soon as uh, something is changing in the, in the field of view of the pixel, it will immediately react and send uh, and send what we call an event. So that's why the, the output of the camera is a synchronous and sparse event stream, um, which, uh, which is adapting and not sampling the scene uh, according to the, to the content. So a concrete example on how the event data would look like. So here on, on the left is a standard frame of uh, some person on the on the right, we see the, the output of the camera accumulated on, on a fixed delta T for, for visual representation. And you can see that when, when there is no movement or if the part of the scene are static, there is no output from the camera. And as soon as there is some, some motion or some movement, movement, like the blinking of the eyes or the, the mouth or the hands moving, the camera will react and acquire the, the information uh, accordingly. So the key uh, benefits of uh, of this uh, of this paradigm are, for the, of course, the temporal resolution, because since each each pixel, as I said, is independent and doesn't rely on a global clock or uh, external frame rate, it can react with a microsecond uh, sub or sub millisecond temporal resolution. So in this case, we we will see the slowdown of uh, of a laser uh, light, which which is um, moved with some mirror system to, to draw these curves, and we can really see uh, by slowing down up to 2,000 equi uh, 2,000 frame per second equivalent, we can really see the the trajectory of this laser. Another benefit is the data reduction, because if we would like to, to acquire the same information with a standard frame camera, the, the amount of redundant information that we acquire would be uh, extremely large. While, for example, here instead, uh, in this counting application, we see that with our, thanks to our camera, we only sense the, the interesting part of the scene in this part, these particles that, uh, that we are counting. And, um, and yeah, with a, with a standard frame camera, instead we would, uh, would acquire, process all over the game, uh, a lot of redundant uh, information. And finally, also we have a benefit, benefit of higher dynamic range compared to, to standard cameras, because again, each pixel is independent, so it can adjust its contrast detection uh, uh, sensitivity to the to the local light intensity at that pixel. So here, for example, when we exit a tunnel with a car, we we can see very well the the contrast inside the tunnel and also outside. Whereas the the, the frame camera is either overexposing or underexposing some some part of the scene. So. At Prophecy, we, we design even based sensors, and we are now at the fourth generation of sensors. So we, we passed from uh, low resolution QVJ uh, early prototypes up to now uh, one megapixel event sensors. Also, the pixel size has been uh, decreasing over the year on, on these different generations. And we are now at uh, uh, the smaller pixel uh, size in, uh, in the industry thanks to a stacked 3D technology. And in particular, this latest sensor has been possible thanks to the collaboration between Prophecy and Sony. And Sony just released the mass production uh, tool 
two versions of the mass production, even sensors, one at VGA and one in uh, HD uh, resolutions. So now I will so, talk more uh, about so the... Ahmed, before we move on there, I think this is a uh, very impressive, I mean, what, what Prophecy has accomplished in, in this space. I mean, uh, the roadmap and also the pixel size and, and the resolution, I think, and, and the striking, I mean, this is, this is super impressive. Uh, two questions here. One is, uh, there are other, um, as far as I know, there are other uh, event driven co companies on, on the market, uh, starting like from, from, from Zurich and other places like um, DVS 128 and so on. What makes Prophecy kind of um, differentiated? What makes Prophecy different compared to like what, what, what other companies do in this, in this space? Uh, is there anything you would like to highlight? Well, I think that uh, especially uh, with this latest generation and the collaboration with Sony, I think that uh, both the term of pixel size and sensitivity and the, the noise reduction that uh, that we have is really uh, probably not comparable with uh, the other even sensors. And in addition to this, which I didn't report here, but in our uh, latest sensor, we, we also have or an um, event uh, processing unit uh, together with the uh, in the chip, which which um, allows us to to even further reduce the event rate, filter directly the event stream on the chip, and select ROI. So do, do uh, uh, also anti flicker. So a lot of, of basic processing to to clean the event stream directly on the chip in a very efficient way. And also, I think the the output, the throughput of the of the event camera, so the, that um, that allows to to keep the very high temporal and fine temporal resolution. It's also uh, I think not uh, not possible with other uh, high, high at least the other uh, high resolution sensor. Thank you. And since we are on the hardware uh, part of the presentation, before we kind of move on to the to the networks. Um, some people may wonder if uh, this uh, type of uh, hardware development kits are available. If, if people would like to kind of to to do some development or to to, to explore uh, this uh, DVS cameras from Prophecy, e either way for people to have some development or evaluation kits and kind of start their own development. Of course, of course. Uh, I think we we have different um, uh, different options for. So we have a uh, simple evaluation kit for people that are just interested in evaluating the technology. We have a development kit for instead of people that want to set, develop their, their own application on top of our of our uh, technology. And I think we also provide the sensor for then a camera manufacturer to integrate our our sensor in uh, in, in their camera models. So yeah, okay. I think uh, yeah the best for this is to contact. Uh, uh, our our uh, our team at Prophecy, and they, they will find the best uh, the best solution for for you. And I, there are a couple of questions from the audience. I think one of them hardware related, and the other two maybe more network related. On the hardware side, uh, Muthafar is asking: Is the response color or monochromatic in the sensor? Color or monochromatic? Yeah, yeah, no, well, yeah. It's only. Uh, it's monochromatic for now. It, we only detect changes in absolute uh, light levels, so we have no no color information. And uh, the, there is a question uh, from uh, Garibaldi. Uh, the question is: You mentioned some processing in the sensor. Is that in any way programmable? Can you do some programmable processing on the sensor? Mm, we have some within why we are very very simple uh, for example we we can select the some ROIs in the in the in the sensor if we just want to 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 select some part of the sensor and this is programmable completely programmable uh, then yeah then I think uh, then there is maybe some parameters of, of the filters that can be programmed but uh, otherwise if you really want to do some more advanced Things I guess the best solution would be yeah, to take our development kit with a FPGA incorporated. Yeah. 
Thank you, Amos. And there is a question from Mac, but I assume you're going to answer this question during your presentation. Uh, the question is, any studies of uh, on bandwidth saving when transmitting images over a network in comparison to conventional frame-based cameras? I assume you're going to cover it next, right? Uh, how how the, uh, your, your camera is compared to the, to the conventional frame-based cameras? Yeah, if some, some material about that, then if we need more, uh, more details, we can, uh, we can uh, go back to the question. Yeah, and one more on, on, on the camera side, uh, also from Matt. Uh, do these sensors adjust the sampling rate per pixel or capture per frame and respond only when there is a change? No, it's really each pixel is uh, independently adjusting uh, the, its, uh, its contrast um, sensitivity and uh, it's, it's uh, logarithmic in the, in the light intensity. But uh, but then the contrast change it's uh, it's global for for the sense. And, and the questions keep coming. Uh, yeah, I think since again, um, it's on the sensor side. What is the power compared to the frame sensor power consumption of, of the of the uh, event driven sensor? Talking about the sensor specifically, not not the, the power consumption, not, 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 not the algorithmic part. The power consumption of the world sensor. Yeah, so uh, uh, of course it depends on the generation. So I'm not sensor expert, but for the latest one, uh, we refer to our ISSCC um, paper of last year. Uh, and of course it depends on the event rate uh, because of course more, more events are generated uh, higher the power consumption, but and also Probably more on the so either look at yeah at this uh, I guess SCC paper or the the data sheets from from Sony about the their uh, even based sensor. Okay, and re related to this, the very last question, and then we'll move on. Uh, related to this three D stacking with Sony, one tone is asking what type of interconnects I use in three D stacking. Do, do, do you know? Um, I would. Wouldn't say I uh, don't want to, to make some mistake here. So again, refer to to our 2020 paper. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Amos. Let's move on to the second part of your presentation. I think that is going to be even more interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, exactly. What? Because as I was saying, so at Profit, we don't only design the sensor, but we also build solutions. Uh, using an event-based sensor, and we have quite a large software offer. In particular, the machine learning tool toolkit is one of the largest one with uh, pre-trained models, data sets, simulators to, to train the models, and, and so on. And um, actually, a lot of the core uh, the core um, algorithm uh, of uh, of our uh, SDK are, are open source. So this is in this way we can I, we want the say the, the community to to really uh, grow fast and uh, more and more people to get confident with the uh, with the technology and start uh, start playing with it. So a lot of it is is really open source and available for everyone. So I would like to talk about a few applications in particular, starting from optical flow because. Since our sensor is very sensitive to, to motion and this high temporal precision is a natural problem to solve. Uh, so it's a standard computer vision problem in which uh, typically now the state of the art is uh, represented by deep, some sort of deep neural networks. So the first approach using a convolutional neural network is uh, FlowNet from uh, 2015 and now these architectures uh, have evolved, but the idea is always to use some, some quite large neural network. Yeah. And the reason why we have to, to use these complex models is because we are trying to solve a quite, quite hard uh, task in which we want to estimate motion from uh, a sequence of static snapshots. And between these snapshots, so we have discrete time in which the object can change shape, can move several pixels. So it's an hard um, data association problem that, that we want to solve. 
by contrast, uh, our, our sensor, if you look at the, for example, the events in a given time interval, uh, they will, uh, they will follow the, the movement uh, in a continuous way. And this simplifies, this greatly simplifies the, the data association if we, if we follow the, the movement uh, with the, this temporal resolution. In particular, we can, we can actually prove that thanks to the precise timings of the, of the events, it's, uh, we can analytically compute the flow. So for example, if we build this representation, which is called the time surface, in which for each pixel, we, we, we display the time of the latest events. So here the recent events are, are white and the oldest one are dark. And so if we do this, we can prove that the slope of this, of this time surface is inversion, inversely proportional to, to the normal flow. So basically we can, we can fit a plane on this surface and, uh, and the slope of the plane will, will, will be related to the optical flow. And of course, this, uh, this estimation is still local. So you have some uh, aperture problem, there is some noise. So you can, you can do better by still using some neural network. But since now we start from a representation which is already very, very close to the flow, we can use a much smaller uh, neural networks. In fact, here we show some results in which we, we show that we can have similar accuracy with uh, these larger flow net models, uh, but reducing by 18 times the, the number of parameters. So here we see the, the events and overlaid on the events is the optical flow with these colored arrows. So the color represents the, the direction and the magnitude is the length of the, of the arrow. So similarly, another uh, another problem that in which even base sensor can can have an advantage is uh, key point detection and tracking. Again, especially in situations in which you have a very fast motion or HDR situations in which standard camera would fail. Here we can say that uh, thanks to the again the temporal resolution of our camera, we can track reliably and very fast all all, all the objects. So we so we we work on this problem. In particular, we, we were wondering uh, what is a key point or a corner point in an event stream because in standard cameras it's quite well understood what, what is a corner. But in, even if you look at the event data, the appearance of this corner will depend uh, on uh, on the speed, in particular, of the object, on the movement of, of the camera, and so on. So that, that's why we, we decided to use machine learning, so a data-driven approach to learn from the data what, uh, what is a corner for even data. And we, so we, we, we follow this approach in which uh, from the input event, we build again some uh, uh, representation similar to the time surface we saw before, uh, but now it's speed invariance because you want uh, to detect the corner independently on the speed and then from this representation on this uh, representation we we apply a very simple very small classifier in this case it was a random forest but can be any any classifier but, and th we show that even a, a simple one can can really work and learn uh, to classify each event as a corner or, or not and the, the advantage we see that we we even further sparsify the, the number of events, so you can reduce the, the computation that we will done after after our corner detector, while keeping the, the temporal resolution. So tracking this corner will, it's very easy because you can just use some nearest neighbor in, uh, uh, in this uh, space and time to to associate the the corners and track them. And here are some some results in which we. On the left, we display the events with the corners in red that are detected. And on the right, uh, we, we track them with this simple rule, our nearest neighbor rule, and we can follow this very fast change of direction and, uh, and uh, very long, uh, very long tracks. Here are some quantitative results in which we, we show uh, state of the art accuracy, and we can show that we can actually process in real time uh, in event stream. So you, on a simple uh, CPU, actually, 
so we can process more than one one mega events per second. And uh, the other problem we, we worked on a uh, lot is object detection. So the advantage of using even camera here is that you can actually have very low latency detection. In particular, you can have uh, detection at any virtually any possible rate because we, we are not limited by fixed frame rate of the camera, but we are only limited by, by computation, as we will see. And when we do uh, object detection on uh, event data, we have to consider that the type of data we have is, is quite different compared to standard frames, because we don't have, uh, let's say, all the information of the scene in a, in a static, uh, in, a, in a single frame, but the information will come gradually over time, because we only detect uh, uh, changes. So this means that we need to accumulate the evidence, and as soon as we have enough evidence, we can react and, and, uh, and have a detection. And to do this, so in this, uh, in this work that we published last year, uh, we do this by uh, using some memory mechanism. So we use uh, convex TM layers. So we have a standard, uh, standard architecture, in which first we, um, so we, we batch the events in, uh, for example, by fixed delta T. We build some rep dense representation out of it. Then we extract low-level features with uh, convolutional uh, layers. And then deeper in the network, we have these uh, convex TM, so these layers with internal memory, which will extract uh, high-level spatiotemporal features. In, in particular, it will, they will remember and, uh, the presence of interesting objects that will be output as, uh, as bounding boxes, for example. So here are some um, visual results. So we, we train this detector and we can see that we can detect very, very, very complex situations, many, many different classes in, uh, here in an automotive scenario, cars, uh, pedestrian and, and bikes and motorbikes with, uh, with very low latency. And so this uh, uh, work in this work, we in particular show that uh, thanks to, to this architecture, we can actually have the same accuracy as a gray level, standard gray level uh, detector, the same on the same data, for which we have both uh, events and frames, and uh, at the same, actually, slightly lower computational cost for, uh, for the events. And we show also that memory is really important for, uh, for uh, when processing the events, because if we now remove the recurrent connections, we the, the accuracy drops uh, dramatically. So this uh, was done on uh, on a data set that we collected and we released. So it's uh, available online and it's uh, the largest data set for uh, uh, object detection for even data. So it, more than 14 hours with 25 million bounding boxes. So we have uh, seven classes uh, related to automotive uh, uh, scenarios, and it's done with our megapixel uh, even camera. So we hope that again with this standard benchmark, the the research and the the, the accuracy of even based model will will keep uh, will keep uh, improving. And uh, also an interesting benefit that we what we have for free is that our detector will naturally generalize with, to night scene because our sensor is uh, invariant to absolute light uh, intensity. It's only detect changes. And so uh, here on the right, we see the output of a detector trained with day data only and applied to night sequences. And we can see that it generalizes uh, quite well. Uh, on the contrary, if we do the same with a frame-based detector, on the left, we see that uh, it will not generalize as well. For example, it's missing the bike on the top, on the bottom left, the pedestrian here on the top, uh, because the statistics at night, uh, of night data is, uh, are very different. We have lower contrast, more motion blur, and, and, and so on. Okay, so I we'll, don't know if there are questions on this second part before passing to the next one. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think we can proceed here, uh, Amos, and then maybe we'll answer the questions at the at, at, when okay. we get to the to the end. Okay. Okay. So uh, what we saw. So now that we can. So the state of the art of uh, yeah. <laughs> machine learning. Do like a, 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 a really. We've, uh, so. Uh, the state of the art today of uh, machine learning with this data is take, to take the input, uh, batch them in, uh, in building a dense representation, or by, okay, for example, batching by n events, and then running a standard neural network on it. So the, the advantage is that we can leverage uh, existing algorithm, architectures, software toolbox, and and also hardware which uh, which is optimized for these uh, for these architectures however we lose uh, some of the advantages of of the event sensor in particular we lose uh, sparsity and uh, power efficiency and some of the temporal temporal resolution so an alternative uh, way of uh, of processing the oh so, sorry before to well, I would like to show you this, uh, this toy problem, which, uh, which is very representative and will explain why uh, it's quite inefficient to process even data on, uh, on a standard hardware. So we, we want to build an histogram. So for each pixel in, a, in the camera, we want to count the number of events at, at that pixel. And we fix the number of events, but we change the, the resolution of uh, of the, of the sensor from QVGA to HD. And uh, what we see when we compute the amount of time taken by it to build the histogram is that the time actually increases. So even if the, the number of computation is the same because we count always the same number of events, uh, we, we spend more time to build the histogram when the resolution increases. And the reason is that uh, we are having more and more cache misses in this case. So these times are real numbers computed on a, on a small mobile platform. So the number, so the amount of cache memory is quite limited. And so every time we receive an event, since uh, we don't know the, where the events will come, so the events arrive in a, a run, almost a random order. So we'll, uh, we'll spend time by moving uh, memory around to, to write at the, like, at the right location. So uh, that's why a different we a different way of processing events that is closer to the to the event camera would be to to use uh, what is called spiking uh, neural networks. And the reason is that if we if we look at, at the pixels in our camera, they can be seen as uh, as actual neurons of of uh, for example an artificial retina. And uh, when an event is generating it's like having a spike out of, of, the, of the neuron. So if we have an object moving in front of the camera, we'll have over time uh, all the pixels that are responding and we'll have this, this plot of, of the different neurons spikings. And the histograms that we were uh, talking about before would be just a, a snapshot in this, in this plot. So if we take these neurons from our retina and now connect them to some other uh, uh, spiky neuron hidden in the, in the network, um, we, and we connect these neurons by some weights, we, we have an architecture that works exactly as our camera, in which computation is done only when there is some activity. So if we have some uh, input spikes in the input layer, depending on the weight and the connection between the the hidden neurons, um, there will be some activity. And if there is some interesting pattern that has been learned by the network, they will, uh, they will generate some activity. In particular, in the output, for example, if you want to classify uh, a gesture, we have different output neurons for each gesture. And only uh, the neuron corresponding to one class will, will react when, when the gesture is, uh, is presented. So there is a, now a vast literature on a spiking neural network and in particular how to train them because uh, since these models are not continuous, but there is some discrete step in the transfer function 
of these models is not um, easy. So you cannot learn uh, apply back propagation as a standard neural network. So there are different approaches, as I was saying. So early approaches, they were uh, using rules inspired by, by the brain, like STDP. Uh, other approaches, they show that you can actually convert arti standard artificial neural network to SNNs and prove that they are equivalent. And uh, so you have the advantage of training them offline and then converting them to SNN to exploit the sparsity. Recently, actually, it's also been shown that by approximating some uh, uh, gradient uh, function in, on the, the spike neural network, you can actually use back propagation, so train end by end these these models, and uh, and so on. So there is this nice uh, overview that is recently been uh, been published, which which has a very nice and com complete overview of these of these uh, models. So today I will uh, I will just show some things that, some applications some something that you can do with these models that they start actually to to solve more and more complex tasks. Here, um, for example, we have a gesture recognition problem uh, in which we train a simple convolutional spiking architecture to to reconnect the gestures, and um, we train this with uh, with active back propagation, and we can see from these, uh, these results that uh, the network learn to output uh, spikes only when a given gesture is, is presented. So here on the top, you see the, the input, so the events at low, low resolution, and here the output spikes with the corresponding gesture uh, highlighted on the, on the bottom. And the interesting thing is that when there is no input, the network is completely silent and will not do computation. So you can, it's really as our camera, you only do computation when there is some activity. And uh, we, we can show that if we have, so we, we can actually reach same accuracy as standard uh, uh, analog neural networks. And if we have, if you want to have very low latency, for example, do uh, inference at one kilohertz, you, you actually uh, can save by using a SNN more than 14 times uh, the, the number of operations. So, so the, now the, the problem is that this number of operation or this computation that you can save is, is uh, mostly theoretical because if you want to run these, uh, these models on, again, on standard hardware, you, you, you cannot fully exploit the, the sparsity because I will as we said before, the, say the event uh, asynchronous nature of these models that is not very suited for uh, for a CPU or GPU or anyway, modern uh, hardware architectures, which are designed to work with uh, very predictable data with uh, standard size, uh, fixed size, fixed uh, temporal uh, interval, and so on. So because of this, uh, to 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 complete to very efficiently process this data and uh, run this model, we need uh, different type of, of hardware architectures. And actually after the neuromorphic retina, which is, which is uh, our event-based sensor, we need a neuromorphic uh, visual cortex. So a dedicated process for, for, for this kind of models. And uh, that's why I'm very happy to announce that uh, we recently announced this collaboration between uh, Prophecy and Syncense. So Syncense, is a company who's developing a, a neuromorphic uh, SNN processors. And so we are co-developing um, a ultra low power device for, for um, uh, edge device solution in which we will we'll combine our event based sensor with their neuromorphic chip. So this will be applied to, of course, IoT, uh, smart devices, uh, and will have very, very low power consumption. So to conclude, we saw that even cameras are low power, low latency vision sensor that they can be uh, used today to, to, to solve uh, very low latency object detection or very high temporal resolution tracking of key points or having uh, optical flow at, uh, at a low cost. 
However, to fully exploit the, the unlock the potential of, of our sensor, we are now exploring and uh, we are developing uh, spike neural networks on our dedicated neuromorphic hardware to, to generate the next generation uh, uh, edge devices. So I thank you for, uh, for your attention. If you, if you have uh, more questions, I'm happy now to, to answer them. Well, thank you for, for the very interesting uh, presentation, Amos. I think, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the prophecy and your team, you've done a lot of interesting work on this space. And that's why we have quite a few questions from the audience as a result. So let's start them kind of in, in, in the reverse order uh, from the back. So a question from Ricardo. Is uh, there an example of motion slow now that the sensor does not report a change in light intensity? Can you can you share some examples? Sorry, can you repeat? Is there? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get the first part of the question. Sorry. The question, is there an example of motion that is slow enough that the sensor doesn't see it, basically? Ah. Yes, I mean the sensitivity depends, of course, on the on the contrast of the object, and also on, on the speed. So, depending on the on the contrast sensitivity of the of the pixels, it can happen that at very low contrast and very low speed, the 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 threshold is not is not passed. Okay. Which, which of course, then you can depending on the application, you can tune these uh, these parameters, but typically. For most application, it's actually a feature because, uh, for example, if, if we look at again at the, at the driving sequence we were seeing before, uh, all the clouds or all the low contrast texture on the sky or on the road, it's something that you don't you don't want necessarily to to detect because it will generate a lot of events that are not meaningful. So, yeah. in, if instead we have some application in which we have Need a very very high sensitivity, then you you can tune the the sensor in order to to detect as as little motion as possible. Yeah. So there is another question: Is there a reason or a value, for example, increase in classification performance in incorporating spike adaptation, uh, for example, similar to leaf um, uh, uh, neurons? instead of fixed threshold spike generation? So, yes, I think, again, it depends on the on the application. So if in your problem, like uh, if you consider, for example, optical flow, you the temporal information is something uh, uh, important to estimate precisely, for example, the speed of the object, then yes, you, you want to, to take this into consideration. For other problems in which only the say the spatial spatial information of of the scene is important, then you you don't necessarily need uh, uh, this level of of temporal precision. Uh, another question from Gar uh, Garibaldi: uh, the accumulation of evidence from the sensor is done in the network or as a pre-processing step? So I imagine is referring to the um, recurrent neural network architecture. Yeah, I, I think so. So in this case, we have uh, so in the input we we fix some small accumulation time, which we again depends on application, but you want this to be a, as small as possible, so that the then it's really the internal um, layers and the LSTM layers. That are that are integrating this information and keep and uh, yeah and building the, the the internal representation that it's then used for for the decision at the end. Uh, okay, two questions from Mark. Uh, is there a correlation between the reconstruction error and the classification performance of the network? Uh, the recon. Construction error. I'm not sure I understand uh, what is the reconstruction error. So in the in the case of object detection, we don't 
we don't reconstruct any frames. So we just give uh, an input some some events. We we build this, for example, in Instagram of a few milliseconds, and then we directly output uh, banding boxes. And and one more from Mark. Uh, by making the, the camera detect a logarithmic uh, change in the visual input, like what, what you what you mentioned earlier, instead of a linear change, is the information in the visual input lost because of the this logarithmic uh, transformation? Um, no, on the contrary, we we we, we expand the, the range of the working range of of our of our sensor. And it's actually our our um, visual system work. We are we are uh, sensitive to logarithmic changes because in this way we can we can have a higher dynamic range. Okay. Uh, so there is a practical question from Stefano, uh, who is interested in um, in this project. Can you ex please explain uh, uh, much better the tracking people part? Like you, sh you showed the demo, um, can you maybe provide a little bit of more detail, or maybe a reference or uh, or link to to the videos or the, the things so people can kind of dive into this? It looks the like people tracking. Like, yeah, people tracking. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the the reference is uh, sorry here I think this detection and detection and, uh, and then you can you can do the tracking and the reference is here is our NeurIPS paper of uh, last year so um, here here exactly is mostly the it's only this in this uh, work we only did the detection so it's outputting bounding boxes at uh, let's say at regular at a regular rate, and then the the tracking can be done, for example, using some standard uh, some st standard tracking techniques. And uh, yes, so since again, since there is some memory in the network, the the bounding boxes they are more consistent over time because it yeah, because you have this consistent representation in the in the network. Yeah, so 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 basically, they can go to the paper and uh, kind of uh, get more information there. I assume, right? Okay. Uh, next question: Is there a way to evaluate the fidelity or goodness of the spike in Korean other than the other than classification performance? Are there any other ways you can kind of see? Um, Qualify the, the, the spike in event other than the classification. Mm. So we mostly work on uh, yeah, on classification problems. I know that there is some work in which they train spike in neural network for optical flow. So I think that yeah, spike in neural network uh, as any other machine learning models, they can output uh, any output that that you train them for. I think most of the people now focused on classification because they are uh, typically a very standard benchmark uh, with standard data set and it's quite easy to, to develop and uh, test algorithms on it. But in principle, they are not limited uh, to, to classification. And uh, I think related to this uh, demo, I think there is a question from Bill. There are hints in a moving picture that 3D aspects can be defined. Uh, am I seeing things in this picture, like uh, related to the 3D aspects? Uh, yeah, it gives this uh, 3D, 3D impression of the, the, the visualization. It's, um, it's a good question. There, there are also work that try to, to estimate the depth from the events. And um, I think there, there is some geometrical properties that that uh, that you can relate between the in the movement, so the uh, yeah, the the optical flow information and the spatial information to to reconstruct in 3D. But uh, yeah, here I think it's, in the visualization is mostly a, a visual visual effect. Okay. 
Uh, I think there is a question. I think you answered this. Uh, are there any effort to integrate uh, CNN hardware to the event-driven stack, uh, which is a sensor, uh, such that spikes no longer need to be transmitted through uh, the uh, AR interface? I assume that's kind of the the collaboration with since 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 you're doing that's kind of to answer this question, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and this is uh, to make totally sense for for us because we have this, uh, this asynchronous stream of events in AR representation, and uh, it can be directly fed into this uh, neuromorphic chip. And uh, if our audience would like to learn more details about this integration of, of your event-driven camera camera with this Incense Spike uh, processor, is there any public domain information there where, where again, they can learn more? Uh, so it's very recent announcement, so I, the best would be to follow as uh, either on our website or LinkedIn, the social media, we are very active in uh, giving the latest, all the la latest uh, developments. Yeah. Uh, question from Hassan. How is the time surface, surface in uh, key point detection speed invariant? Oh, yeah, good question. Yes. Um, so basically, instead of uh, using the time, so similar to, to here, which in every pixel here you, you report the time, in the, let's say, time uh, speed invariant one, you only report the relative order of, of the events. So it's uh, again a local representation. So you select uh, a local local region. In this local region, you 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 will uh, put the order of arrival of the events independently on the absolute time, but just the relative the relative order. So this gives you a sort of time surface, which doesn't depend on the speed, just on the arrival order. And uh, yes, again more details uh, uh, in the in this uh, CVPR paper. Okay. Uh, it was clear. Great, thank you. Uh, one interesting, now I'm doing questions by, by, by likes, by popularity. Uh, one interesting and important question, what, what training frameworks methodology was used to train uh, your CNN? What, what kind of frameworks you use for this? Your, I assume it's your, your own. For the uh, CNN or for the SNN? <laughs> For the uh, CNN, SNN. So oh, the, sorry, for the spiking, for, for the SNN. yeah, spiking one. Yeah, we developed our own. Uh, yeah, it was our own library. And if people would like, is it, is it like open source? If people would like to do, or it's your kind of? No, this, this one it was uh, no, this internal. one was an internal internal development, in which we re-implemented. Uh, uh, yes, this surrogate gradient, uh, surrogate gradient. Uh, um, paper mm, that we, we also experimented uh, so with existing ones so there there is a, a slayer which is very very famous from Gary Korcher um, which is very is written in PyTorch so it's very handy very nice but there are many many of them so I don't want to make it. Yeah. Uh, there is a very interesting question on the use case. When event-driven camera is mounted on a moving object, like for example on a on a car, uh, most pixels will be active. And in this case, is the reduction on data volume from the sensor uh, to to S and N when 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 the camera is moving? Yes, it's true that uh, you you will activate many of them, but yeah. Again, as you see here, it's the output is still pretty sparse. So the road, the sky. Uh, all the re uniform region are, are still uh, not generating any. So, so compared, I think we have some a number, but compared to let's say 50 or 60 uh, FPS uh, videos, you, you still have some uh, the benefit of of, of the event rate. Uh... Then uh, related to this, I think that will be the last before last question. Uh, question uh, from Jan. Uh, the real output of the DVR sensor could be noisy. What is the pre-processing technique 
or techniques that has been employed um, to the prophecy data? Do you do any pre-processing to do kind of denoising? Yes, yes, there are different type of filters that uh, that we can apply. So in our so in our um, software uh, development kit, uh, our software suite that you can you can access. There are some let's say un uncrafted filters which renoy, which will uh, remove uh, isolated events. So this, for example, for these isolated events, it's quite simple. You you look in a neighbor root of, of the pixel if there is no other uh, events in a, in a given time you can you can say that it's noise then some more complex filters which will uh, filter flickering light because again by looking at the at the times of the events if you can, if you see a uh, regular uh, frequency a regular um, a regular period in the in the events at the given pixel you can uh, you can the, detect this, uh, this flickering source and you can either filter or, or use it as, as, as information. And here when we do, uh, when you apply standard com convolutional neural network on top of it, it, the filtering is done naturally by the network. So because we, we build this histogram, so it's already uh, averaging somehow the, the, the information and then the, the neural network will, will, will learn the, the the meaningful information and similarly for the spiking spiking neural network they, they should be able to to learn to to be to do insensitive to to noise no that that's great uh there are a couple more questions maybe i'll answer them quickly so there is a question from Marie ricardo are there any existing tiny ml demos with the event driven cameras i think you showed some of them like the gesture this pedestrian the face detection and so on uh, there is a question from Steve on on the size of the event-driven cameras compared to the frame-based cameras. I think you answered that that one also by showing the roadmap and kind of the, the stacking. And I would like to conclude with one question uh, asked at the very beginning uh, of this presentation: Is prophecy looking for as an neuromorph neuromorphic scientist potentially in conjunction with a PhD? So this person is having experience with event cameras, uh, SNNs, and some neuromorph neuromorphic chip and interested in continuing this field. So, so basically the question is, do we have job openings in this space so people can, can apply and join, join you? Yes, yes, we do. So we are actually hiring in different, uh, different positions. So again, uh, you, can, you can look at our website. I think we have all the list of job offers. Um, we you you can also write write me an email if you if you have some more specific questions but so yeah definitely we are interested in, in this kind of profile and this is a great way co to conclude this very interesting presentation it's good to see you you're doing so much cool research and products in this space mm -hmm. and hiring and expanding i think really, really exciting to be kind of in this field well, thank you, Amos, again. So maybe we can conclude with our um, uh, final slides um, and we'll acknowledge yes, our, 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 our sponsors. And uh, and then again, the video will be available tomorrow on TinyML YouTube channel. So if you're interested in, in uh, checking it again. Yeah, so this is the list of the, of the sponsors and strategic partners. And now we'll acknowledge them one by one. Uh, AON devices, uh, let's, if you need to go to the next one. Uh, um, yeah, ARM is the software and hardware foundation for TinyML. Then we have, uh, who's next? Uh, DeepLight, uh, they use AI um, to make uh, other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Next, please. Uh, uh, Edge Impulse, TinyML for all developers. Next one, MZ Visual Sense, uh, AGI Visual Sensors. Uh, green Wave Technologies, enabling the next generation of sensors and hearable products uh, to process rich data with energy efficiency. HOTG, uh, distributed infrastructure for tiny ML applications. Latin AI uh, develop adaptive um, AI for the intelligent edge. 
Maxim integrated, and they're part of uh, analog devices now. They enable edge intelligence. Uh, Kixo AutoML uh, develop um, uh, automated uh, machine learning uh, platform uh, that builds dynamic solutions for the edge using sensor data. Qualcomm, um, it's my company, uh, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ambiguous. Uh, Reality AI, uh, they add advanced sensing to uh, your product with Edge AI Tiny ML. SenseML builds uh, smart IoT sensor devices from data. Sensense, I think you mentioned Sensense today. Uh, they, they develop neuromorphic uh, spiking chips. Sintent, uh, end to end uh, deep learning solutions for tiny ML and uh, edge AI. And again, our uh, next presentation is going to be this Friday live from Venice in Italy, and it's going to be an in person event. It will be in Italian starting at 8 a.m. Pacific. Yeah, I think uh, we are done at this point. Thank you for your attention and thank you, Amos, very much for your for your presentation and a lot of um, interactivity and questions during the presentation. So really looking forward to seeing more progress from Prophecy and maybe giving us an update in some time again. Mm -hmm.